Yo, greetings everyone and welcome to part 4 of the Deviant Art Iceberg by Nora. Without further ado, let's jump right on into it. An unwavering darkness has now begun to envelop us. What was once a hallway of familiars, an endless tunnel of halls, has turned into a wall backing us in. Walls upon walls upon walls, littered with paintings, twisted depictions, grimacing faces, and stories of those who have sunk into this trap. Those who lie here sleep, forgotten, for one reason or another, except for those who dare to wander into the dark, unknown, like you and I, those that might even find comfort in such a place. However, in this shadowy abyss, cutting through the haze of utter terror, is but a lone staircase in the middle of the room, leading down into some far stranger place. Though the steps may be made of porcelain, down there is a dark restoration, ill-fit of its grandeur. Well, all the same, dear traveler, it would appear there is only one way to go from here, and that is down. Clowns be clowning slash Lyra Luce. To start this tier, we have a rather disturbing story. DA and Reddit user Lyra Luce, I believe is how you pronounce it, took to r slash creepy encounters to recount a rather disturbing page she found on DeviantArt, which reads as follows. Quote, About four years ago, one of my longtime friends on DeviantArt sent me an urgent message, telling me to check out a profile of a user I'll call Clowns Be Clowning to protect his identity. The creepy thing about this DeviantArt profile was that it was basically a shrine to me. It had details about my life on it that only people who knew me personally or had been following the journals on my various websites would be aware of. I read through the guy's personal journal on the profile section of his page, and let's just say there was some disturbing stuff posted on it. There were hundreds of pictures of me. Where he got them, I had no idea, as I only let close friends view my pictures on my personal Facebook page. And underneath the pictures, he would list creepy things like, I'm always watching you, and I want to wear your skin. He would also post links to my writing, art, and music websites and tell people to watch me because I'm an angel, was perfect, and everyone should be like me. I was basically a religion to this guy that he was even going so far as to try and convert people to. It was one of the strangest things I have ever encountered, and I was terrified when I read everything though. I told my mom about the DeviantArt user and she told me that we should report it to the police so we went to the station to give an official statement. The police turned out to be pretty useless, stating that we should take our issue to the website administrators, basically the DeviantArt staff, and have them resolve the issue from their end. So I contacted one of the admins on DeviantArt who was so freaked out by the profile they literally responded to my message the next day telling me that they had deleted the profile as soon as they saw it. Anyone who uses DeviantArt is aware that the stuff usually takes a week or so to get back to you about an issue. 
So that just gives you an idea of what a freak this user was. The staff member told me to also report the user to the police, which I said that I had with no results. So they took the extra step and banned the user's IP, and even checked to see if he had made any shadow accounts on the site. They deleted everything related to this guy. But I still have a printout of what I took to the police, which I keep filed with the police report. I don't know who that guy was, but I hope that I will never have to find a creepy page like that on DeviantArt, or any other site for that matter, ever again." Unquote. Now, this does sound really creepy, but do bear in mind that there is no actual evidence of such a page existing, and since it was supposedly all deleted, this story really cannot be proven. There is also a question of how the friend found out about this page, as I would have assumed that the friend was the person doing this since they found it before the person who was supposedly being stalked did. It would help if there was kind of any sort of screenshot or any sort of evidence to go with the story, but as it stands, if true, it sounds like quite the creepy tale. But if not, it's just an internet creepypasta, essentially. So, who knows? Firing of Jark. For unknown reasons, Jark or Scott, again one of the founders of DeviantArt, was fired in 2015, with the decision being met with mixed reactions by the community. Jark even shared a poll on his personal DA page afterward asking if he started a new site, if people would join, and 89% voted yes, purely off of his appeal alone. Judging by the insane amount of communities and groups dedicated to this guy, Jark has certainly left a lasting impact on DeviantArt in more ways than one. Deviant Cemetery. This rather somber group is dedicated to DA users who sadly passed away, where they are documented, remembered, and mourned by those close to them. The group has been around since May 24th of 2010, and has its eternally resting users documented in alphabetical order. While a very noble and even touching gesture, there is a very heavy feeling that comes with looking at the avatars, names, and causes of deaths of so many, especially so many young artists whose lives were tragically cut short through one means or another. The comment section is also full of those who are reflecting on the lives and deaths of their friends here. From old age to cancer, to natural disasters, to even, unfortunately, the page is updated regularly and is a harrowing reminder of one's mortality. May they all rest in peace. Sonic X Amy 09. Real name Jenny, user Sonic X Amy 09, as the name suggests, is in the Sonic fandom, having been active since 2009. She has a long-running comic series called Sonic Got Amy Pregnant. Said comic follows Sonic juggling parenthood along with his many qualms with Amy Rose. It's one of those types of fan comics, you know the ones where they're all kind of living in a domestic, sort of normal sort of lifestyle. Though strangely enough, Sonic is characterized in this comic as a bit of a deadbeat dad, half of the time, and most of the humor comes from poking fun at Sega's many horrible choices with the Sonic IP, as well as Sonic's lackluster recent games. Well, recent games at the time, I should say, since as of 2014, she hasn't made any new entries in her comic series, and actually I couldn't find any evidence of her online at all since 2014 actually. Hopefully she's okay, but all the same, her comic definitely made the rounds. And in my research for this entry, I even found that a fanfiction over on fanfiction.net from 2013 entitled Son Amy Love Story by user Swift Art Star notes that she asked for permission from Sonic X Amy 09 to use her Son Amy baby characters for this fanfic, meaning that the characters were at least popular enough for someone to write a fanfiction involving them. And that's gotta count for something, right? Fridge Poet Project Started by poet and writer Catherine McKennett, the Fridge Poet Project is a poetry movement using the style of Fridge Madniks to spell out poetry. A simple gimmick on the surface, the concept ended up inspiring a multitude of people, 
many of which sharing their stories in the very familiar imagery of fridge magnets. This style was very much intentional, as it's meant to create a sense of nostalgia, which also fits thematically because many of the poems made using this have themes of love and childhood innocence, growing up and experiencing life as this evergreen beginning, the start of something beautiful. It's optimism incarnate. The DA page for the project hosts hundreds of these, all sharing stories and experiences. One user wrote, They say a touch of madness glimmers there behind her eyes, sparking storms that sing with light and haunting lullabies. Another wrote, You haven't sung a song, my dear, in oh so very long. Come, let the music kiss our lips, let it make you strong. Sadly, Catherine herself would pass her away in 2019 from stage 4 colon cancer, but her legacy of creating a fun format for people to express themselves and talk about their pasts, and in general inspiring many, is the legacy that she leaves behind. Excelion, a very popular artist in the a uh, crotophilia community with over 6 million page views. Ixilion boosts a very vivid array of various anime girls in casts or having multiple limbs amputated and more. And I will say that again, the drawings are technically fine. And hey, amputees gotta have love too, right? But this page definitely feels like it's fetishizing the tragedy aspect of this and comments under some of these drawings are um very unnerving to say the least quote the doctor in this hospital will find further medical issues in the upper thotatic and the cervical spine and possibly her jaw another wrote that's cruel no chance of changing the catheters Genie probably prepared some plumbing. Like I've said before, you guys do you, I don't really care. But at the same time, I do find this particular fetish and the implications behind it to be quite creepy, I must be frank. Arkham Insanity slash Spanking Rabbit Hole. Yet another strange rabbit hole, Arkham Insanity and similar artists have a rather extreme fetish for spanking. I'm unsure of what all I can actually show on YouTube in regards to this fetish, but Arkham Insanity themselves have tons of art depicting characters being spanked. And that's honestly kind of whatever. I mean, so what? They're being spanked, it's a fetish, fine. However, the thing that I took note of more than the actual spanking pictures are the general themes of child punishment and abuse on the page as well as unfortunately this being a central theme in other pages centered around spanking. There is a lot of art of child characters being abused by older characters, of being humiliated, of being spanked, of being forced into wearing things and then humiliating them more after the spanking and generally getting hurt. There's also on Arkham and Sandy's page in particular, a comic about a guy who was once an adult who got rebirthed, whatever the fuck that means, so to speak, as a six year old, and then of course, spanked by a busty woman. Frankly, it all makes me extremely uncomfortable, especially because it's clear by the comments and the way that all of this is drawn, that the people drawing and enjoying this content are getting off to depictions of child characters getting abused, adult characters dominating younger characters, and even themes of incest and general really fit within these depictions. It's fucking sickening. Even if it's not real, and it's all just drawings, mind you, so no actual children are being hurt. So that is a clear difference, right? Something about these pages still just churns my stomach and just generally feels rather ominous. I suppose I should note that a normal spanking fetish is probably just fine. You do you. It's specifically the child abuse stuff 
made within this context that is one of the darker and sadly more popular fetishes on the website. Where the fetish, I believe, is no longer the spanking, but rather the abuse of children. Truly one of the most disgusting fetishes on the site. But on a lighter note, one of the other more popular fetishes are... Bonus Entry, Foot Fetish. This probably should have come up by now, to be honest, since it's also one of the most popular fetishes on the site and a far more innocuous one, even if I personally don't really get it either. But yeah, in case you didn't know, there is a lot of people that love drawing realistic feet and find them very attractive. There is always a style to how these feet are depicted as well. Like, the wrinkles of the feet are always drawn in a particular way that never really looks quite right to me, and always seems to be clashing with the cartoony art style of whatever character that they're drawing. There isn't really much more to this fetish though, and I suppose all things considered, like I said, is a pretty basic one. And it is also often connected with the tickle fetish, which is exactly what it sounds like, a people who enjoy tickling people's feet and ribs and what have you, they just find it generally attractive, I guess. Darian Shields. Fanfic writer Darian is a more low-key member of the community, having only 900 watchers and around 300k page views. The primary subject of their fanfictions are fetish-based, a pregnancy fetish to be precise, though many have pointed out that he is actually a pretty decent writer, and you could almost mistake his fanfics for being something, well, just kind of normal, if it weren't for the highly detailed descriptions of pregnancy somewhere deep within the recesses of the fanfictions. Anime James Fetish Drama Slash Grooming Accusations Alright, talk about quite the fucking rabbit hole. Buckle in boys, this is gonna get weird really quickly. Anime James, or James William Barkley III, is a YouTuber, or a former YouTuber I should say, animator, artist, DA user, voice actor, musician, etc. He's a man of many talents and many interests. He has over 10 years worth of content, some of which centered around his own series and OCs, and yet much more of which centered around Sonic the Hedgehog and My Little Pony stuff. His most recognizable works being that of a mass collab brony music video parody of Michael Jackson's Beat It, his Sonic characters versus MLP characters videos, and the Marvel musical, I guess. M.A. James was a popular guy, and his channel would end up earning over a million subscribers. However, in 2014, controversy would arise as Tumblr and DeviantArt accounts were discovered matching his art style, featuring art of various underage characters, and even some people that James knew in real life who were also underage, farting, amongst other things. That comic, based on the person that he knew, was called Haley Flower, and according to James, was based on a real friend accidentally farting on his face when he was younger, which I guess is where the whole fetish began. The other page he had was one called Sonic Girls, which according to the Tumblr page's description says, The four main females of the Sonic universe live under one roof and do a bunch of girly things. New comic every Wednesday. Ho ho ho, and girly things indeed did they do. So what were these girly things? Well, these girly things just so happen to be farting on one another, shitting their pants, giving laxatives to each other so that they could shit in their pants accidentally, and uh, talking about boys while farting and shitting your pants. Are you uh, <laughs> uh, beginning to see a bit of a theme here? A possible central narrative to these comics yet? Many fans were rather disgusted by this discovery, and while at first James tried to deny having a fart fetish and deleted the Sonic Girls Tumblr page and what have you, he would then shortly after this discovery go on to create another DeviantArt page called Weirdo Animated James, dedicated to what else but fart fetish art. James would then go on to claim that quote, 
he'd been drawing eproctophilia art, that's fart fetish art, before he realized it and was aware of how weird it was, unquote. But ultimately, it was a passion of his. And it certainly didn't end there, as according to the Wikitubia, or the YouTuber Wiki, quote, Around 2014, James began an online relationship with an artist named Michaela, also known as Toxic Soul 77 after talking with each other on Skype. However, at the time, Michaela was 17, while James was 21, with rumors spreading that he could have groomed her. Many people would go on to call him a penal for that rumor for this. James had attempted to defuse the drama by saying that the age of consent in New York, where he lives, is 17. But people still criticized his relationship. On December 29th, 2015, James then announced on Twitter that Michaela broke up with him following the drama. Then, on August 19th of 2019, the voice actress for Penny from C Students, one of James' series, Awkward Marina, posted a document on Twitter saying that she had left C students since the show had many sexually explicit material and James had wanted to date her, even suggesting that he would fly out to her location. She was also 17 at the time. When she left, James became furious and allegedly encouraged his fan base to harass her. Years later, he admitted he failed to recognize the imbalance of the relationship and wish that he hadn't done so." Unquote. All of this controversy would eventually lead to animated James' retirement, uploading a video in 2018 to his channel announcing the retirement from his channel due to mental health reasons. Then, later in 2022, he would make a twit longer after his four-year hiatus basically apologizing for his actions and how he treated others and that he plans on getting therapy. What's more is he also believes that he deserves all the criticism and hate that he received and believes that he still does. Many people ended up supporting his stance and wishing him the best of luck in possibly getting the help that he might need. There is much more drama connected with animated James, updates, Brony Kong related drama, and info surrounding animated James in general. But I think that you get the point by now. Closed Species Tangentially connected to adoptables, closed species are an original creation that the creator sells the rights to. Unlike OCs, you're buying the right to make an OC. That's the same species as the one the creator made. Say for example, I made a closed species that's an owl with uh, blades for feathers and uh, big red eyes and breathes fire and what have you. Well, if you buy it from me, you now have that species and no one else can draw pictures of that species except for you because you paid for it. In theory, of course. Closed species are more run on a trust system rather than copyright. But a species is too broad of an idea to be protected by copyright, so it's not like you can even claim ownership anyway. It's kind of a silly idea to me personally, and reeks of that old my OC don't steal type of culture that all takes all of this a bit too seriously for my blood. But hey, lots of people find this stuff fun to make and to buy, so at least they're getting something out of it. Inktober Controversy Inktober is an annual artist event held on DA and Twitter where artists draw using, uh, well, ink. There is some variants of this, like some people actually have themes for each day of the month and what have you. This, however, halted in 2018 when artist Alfonso Dunn accused Jake Parker of plagiarizing his book and the concept of Inktober. Now, this didn't come out of nowhere because Alfonso only did this because Jane Parker tried to copyright the event since they were the one that started the whole Inktober challenge all the way back in 2009 as an internet thing. He believed that since he was the creator of Inktober and felt responsible for anything that comes from it, that he should protect his property by choosing to copyright Inktober. This kind of split many who participated in the event in half. Some saw Parker as holding Inktober hostage, while others simply saw him as rightfully protecting his intellectual property. Despite the controversy, the majority of artists still participated in the event, 
that same year. That's when shortly after, Alfonso Dunn accused Parker of plagiarizing his book, Pen and Ink Drawing, of which was shown in a now private video. Anyway, that's the controversy, and it further split people, with many choosing to make new events for October, to still have fun with an event, and stay away from the bad blood of Inktober and its controversy. While some still do participate in Inktober, and hold their own events for it, etc, etc. Christian Sonic Fan Art This entry pertains to a bizarre subgenre of fan art that emerged on DA featuring Sonic characters in Christian themes and settings. But it is slightly debatable if these are legitimate or trolling. From what I remember, these started out as legitimate, since there is actually a lot of fan art that centers around a character finding faith or hope or redemption in Jesus Christ, and they are usually pretty innocently made. Sonic is certainly not the only franchise to have this, it's just Sonic is the franchise that everyone pays attention to when something goes on, but I'm sure you would find many Super Mario Christian fan art, Legend of Zelda Christian fan art, Final Fantasy, etc, etc. But back in the day, these were some of the easiest targets for arguments and trolling on DeviantArt, and so art would later be made that was essentially made as bait. Nonetheless, it is one of the more niche fan art themes from back in the day, and pretty innocuous. Bonus Entry Sesame Street Fan 2003 Sometimes a random new entry for one of these icebergs can just kind of fall into your lap. And this was definitely the case with this user. Sesame Street Fan 2003 is one such user we came across when my Discord server was randomly discussing death battle matchups, you know, from that death battle channel, or rather random death battle matchups that we found on Google Images that were clearly fake and that we found kind of funny, and we had kind of funny arguments about who we thought would win and lose, etc, etc. It was then that our local Oversoul found that many of the fan images came from one user on DeviantArt named Sesame Street Fan 2003, who not only made a ton of these, but had a rather strange page overall. For one, their account was only a year old, but they had over 150,000 page views, which is quite unusual. More unusual, though, was that there was over 6,000 pieces of art that they had made. Well, I say art, but most of them are just various memes, often repeated at nauseum, such as the aforementioned death battle images, a folder dedicated to their hatred of Caillou, you know, the cartoon character, one dedicated to their love for Teen Titans Go, and their hatred towards My Little Pony, despite some of the risque MLP art that they have favorited in groups that they are in, so that's a bit funny. Also, a dedicated folder to Elmo vs. Doomsday Death Battle thumbnails for some mysterious reason, as well as a folder of over 150 memes of various characters laughing at the children's cartoon character Nihao Kai Lan, crying because I guess they really, really fucking hate this cartoon character for some reason that's, I think, beyond my comprehension. They also have a list of 20 rules before engaging with their page or content period in both a friend and an enemy list. Which, I'll be honest, I do remember people back in the day having enemy list or shit list or troll list or something back in the day, but it's been a while since I've seen a nice, classic, genuine enemy list on DeviantArt. The vitriol and concentrated venom to be able to do that and keep it consistently on your DeviantArt page is something that I never tire of seeing. And this user seems to have clearly stirred up some trouble, because they seem to actively be fighting other users and groups on DA, and engaging in silly internet drama, generally speaking. Which is why they probably have so many pay views, as well as enemies, I would assume. I suppose this is what they wish to do with their time, so it's really whatever. Wanna make 150 memes about characters laughing at some other random children's cartoon character? You do you! Pop off, I guess. But still, 
Sesame Street Fan 2003 is a good example of a type of page that I've seen since the beginning of DeviantArt. A page full of anti-groups, anti-art, memes, crossover art, and generally groups of people that they hate. You might as well call them a drama artist or an anti-user. But all the same, it's always been a strange genre of page that I've come across so many times in my past on DeviantArt that seeing such a recent example reminds me that some things truly never change, I suppose. Arvalis. This user is a very popular artist on DeviantArt, most well known for their pieces depicting Pokemon in this super realistic fashion. Arv is a very talented artist, and he's also active in other fandoms like Monster Hunter and Godzilla. Hatalia S, or Hatalia Ass, I don't know, one of the two I assume. Given the Italia series is about personified countries slash historical events, many artists choose to depict certain events with a very infamous example being user Italia S. From the Holocaust to the Unit 731 to the Blitzkrieg, their art, while actually quite nice looking, can come off to many is quite distasteful, as it is depicting these horrific events through the depictions of Hatalia characters. Ping the Hungry Fox. Having left DA, Ping is a very well-known furry vor artist with many pieces featuring his persona named Ping. The Fun Police. Now gone, this user is mostly known for their original webcomic called Um or UM and various belly inflation art. While their reason is unknown for their departure, an archive exists on their page. And while his DA is gone, he still has a Twitter and is rather active if you wish to partake in his stuff. Flare Milk. This is another inflation artist with a particular love for cow-themed people. So like people with giant udders, sets of like 80 or so breasts, etc. I uh, cannot show you almost anything from their gallery uh, due to this, but they are quite popular in that fetish to say the least. Nazi groups. Ah, it's now time to take a plunge into politics on DeviantArt. I'm sure you are all dying for this part. Well, like any place online, there are indeed Nazis on this site, like unironic ones, as well as groups dedicated to them and the ideology. These users and pages are, for obvious reasons, attract a lot of negative attention, though there are also a lot of roleplay groups and some people who are just kind of edgy trolls that are trying to bait arguments from people online. Others are also, strangely enough, Nazi fetishists. That is, people who draw porn or fetish art, but include Nazis within the mix. Sometimes it's just kind of a normal fetish art with a Nazi just randomly being involved, and other times it's clearly centered around, uh, well, Nazis at a concentration camp sort of angle if you catch my drift. Pretty wild and sick shit. Bonus Entry, Nazi Furs. An extremely strange niche of the furry fandom are Nazi Furs, or Nazi Furries. It's exactly what you think it is, and there's a good heaping of art and furries dressed up like it to go along with it. Now, according to wikifur.com, the Nazi Fur community first came about on a live journal community back in March of 2005. Quote, the community became the first unified group of furs specifically interested in the history of Nazi Germany and the Third Reich. According to the community's founder, Banelhart, of the intended purpose of the community was to be an umbrella community encompassing the varied interests of individual furs within the specific topic. This was intended to include, but not be limited to, reenacting, uniform fetish, military history and tactics, and anthropomorphic art set during World War II. As of January 2017, the community had 337 posts, 2,034 comments, and 105 members. The Nazi Furs Live Journal community states that they seek to further the understanding of Hitler's Germany through study and discussion, and will actually refuse registration to any applicants or affiliated with any hate groups. 
Users who post anything containing anti-Semitism, racial hatred, or ethnic cleansing unless done in an obviously humorous, sarcastic, or satiric light will be banned." Unquote. Now, while that sounds like there isn't anything serious about these Nazi furs, that it's all just kind of a big LARP, it seems like that was either never the case, or people would later definitely not get the memo on that said LARP, and were instead literally Nazi furries with no sense of irony, and instead full-on hatred. Yep, they really believe in the furry master race, apparently. All the same though, these are certainly an interesting subculture of both furry and, um, National Socialist fandoms, I guess. Be they deadass serious or just kind of pretending. Bonus entry, communist groups. Same as the Nazi groups, there are a ton of communist groups on DeviantArt. In fact, there's not only more of them, but they are also far more popular than the Nazi ones. There is, of course, a lot of art for and against communism, as you might imagine on the website, and even groups like Soviet Equestria, where it's all art related to My Little Pony characters, or My Little Pony OCs, and communist attire and what have you. Oh, and in case you're wondering, yes, there is also Nazi and commie bronies, and also, also, yes, there is also communist furries. Like, actually a lot of them, to be perfectly honest, and it's a lot less ironic. Which is true across the board, really, and for some reason seems to be more commonly accepted online, even though both communism and national socialism were equally evil, and both led to millions of innocent people being tortured and killed, starved or otherwise, as well as just general despair. And while I do see many people who are quick to point out all the Nazi groups, perhaps rightfully so because they're cringe and bad, I don't really see as many people pointing out all the communist groups which I think are equally cringe and bad. But yeah, all these people are fucking crazy and love LARPing or philosophically siding with history's most evil losers. So uh, yeah, pretty cringe overall I must say. Bonus entry, the politics forum. Okay, one last one pertaining to politics for a bit. But yeah, in the DA forums, there is a politics section, and as you might imagine, it's a tumultuous place, full to the brim of people on all sides of the spectrum, discussing current world events, debating their sides, or yelling at one another for one reason or another. It's also, unsurprisingly, one of the most active parts of the forum, even to this day. Which is actually saying something since the forums are certainly a shell of what they used to be back in the day. But this section lives on while other parts like the entertainment section of the forums with gaming, movies, music, and books languishing in complete near silence by comparison. Kaforia. Kaforia is a Vor artist who's been around since the early 2000s with his art being most known for the choppy style that sort of looks like generic cutouts or stock weird PNG art of characters. Now, that's where it would normally end. Just another Vor artist who really cares at this point. But this fellow has quite a history of drama and content worth mentioning. For one, this guy has made hundreds of short animations depicting various characters being Vored though a favorite of his seems to be Sonic characters. Most of these animations were once on his YouTube channel until it was eventually taken down for reasons that I'll get into momentarily. However, there does exist an archive of them, so why don't we take a little peek at a couple of them real quick, such as this little masterpiece entitled Macro Amy Beach. Probably nothing. Sonic! Help me! Wake up, Sonic! Come on! Help! Uh -huh. Help me! Wake up, Sonic! Shut up, Tails!
lagi. Or how about the family classic, Amy's Misunderstanding? Some of you who used to watch cringe compilations back in the day might recognize the art style of these animations as they were often shared around in these cringe comps as well as just generally speaking were shared for their fascinating subject matter, shall we say. For as many animations as he's made, after watching quite a few of them, they're all very formulaic and pretty much always end with someone being bored for one reason or another with no resolution as to what the hell happens after. If they spit them up, if they shit them out, or they just keep them in there forever or something. They also look remarkably the same. Like in the 16 years this man has been making content, these animations have not improved or changed at all. That may be partly by design, but all the same it's worth noting, since usually in that time some kind of improvement or at least change, an evolution of any kind, would happen to most people's art styles. But this is clearly not the case with the Kephora's art. And of course, on top of these animations, he has also made thousands of pieces of art across these 16 years on the DeviantArt platform, of which he is still extremely active on to this day. But what about why these animations got taken off of YouTube? Well, by 2018, Kephora reached over 162,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel, and even received his silver play button reward, but faced numerous problems regarding the new community guidelines of YouTube, and ended up getting his account terminated due to this, probably in some part due to them kind of being Elsagate-esque. Even if these were made far before Elsagate was ever even a thing, they did accidentally line up with the whole short, repetitive, badly animated shorts with blatant fetish content, with copyright characters no less, but just lined up perfectly with content of that ilk. In fact, in my research, I saw many, many, many accounts of people who discovered his videos as children, who were just innocently watching online videos and animations regarding Sonic the Hedgehog when one of his videos would come up. And it seemed to kind of freak a lot of them out when they were first exposed to them and the vor fetish as a whole. Truly tragic how many children's pure and simple innocence was taken away from them because of these fucking vor Sonic animations. He would then move on to Daily Motion for a time to upload his animations before then moving on to Odyssey, where he is still pretty active to this day. Kephora would also end up getting an Encyclopedia Dramatica page, as well as a Kiwi Farms thread. As for as low effort as his stuff is, he made a real name for himself online and many became interested in documenting him or mocking him over his fetish material. Overall, a very peculiar yet prolific artiste of, uh, his sort, Amuria. Amuria, aka Jennifer, is probably one of the biggest pioneers of DA, but also a user who got screwed over pretty badly due to petty early internet drama. She's most known for being the originator of the Moe girl style, 
or at least in the fan sense, with very saturated bright colors and a shiny look achieved through the generous use of the Photoshop Dodge tool. Viewing her page now shows that she has amassed over 21,000 followers and 1. million page views, despite being inactive since 2008. Her art seems to be heavily inspired by key visual novels as well, like that of Clannad. Sadly, her downfall occurred when another prominent artist, Just Fly a Kite, began calling out Amuria by saying that she didn't deserve the daily deviation because she had a generic art style. With the original journal stating this along with the rant unfortunately being lost to time now. More and more people started noticing that a lot of her characters had the same blank expression and rather stiff poses. There were also a few other older artists with very similar shading styles to Amuria's, such as Ryo Oki, Vanilla Sticks, and Senra, to name a few. This gave rise to a theory that these artists were in fact the same person, and that Amuria was lying about her age. There was also an incident where another user, Shin Man Chan, claimed to be Amuria's cousin, though that this claim was never actually confirmed, mind you, went onto her page and asked her house college, which to the community was further proof that Amuria was lying about her age. Though, again, there was no actual proof that any of this was true and wasn't just simply the acts of trolls. Honestly, the whole thing seems like sour grapes from some bitch who got upset over someone whose art style that they didn't gel with, getting the Daily Deviation Award. It's a shame because there is a charm to Amiria's artwork, and it would have been cool to see where she went as the years went on and her art style evolved. And personally, I don't really see anything wrong with her art style anyway. I think some people were just being straight up pretentious. But unfortunately, she was bullied off of the site for no real good reason at all. Thus, her page stands as her legacy on the site, with many visiting it and seeing just how unfairly judged and harassed this clearly talented woman was. Shinprod22 Shinprod22 is a user who's active in numerous fandoms, but most know him for the Simpsons fandom, with many of their works tackling Homer and Marge dealing with the loss of Bart, Maggie being a stillborn, or Homer and Marge being teens and realizing they're pregnant. There is also a lot more, I guess what you'd call normal Simpsons fan art as well, but that being said, the Bart being dead story concept had a ton of different pieces dedicated to it, as you can probably see here on screen. While it's a bit off topic for this iceberg, it kind of reminds me of those old fanfiction categories, uh, specifically the hurt and comfort category, which if you go to nearly any fanfiction website, you are sure to see somewhere. Uh, that being a fanfiction where something awful happens to the cast or a specific character, and then the rest of the story is about said characters then comforting each other finding closure, dealing with their trauma, etc. Now, if you want a little personal antidote, I remember years and years ago, back on one of my old DeviantArt accounts, I made a fanfiction about Star Fox, in which it was Christmas time and everyone was having a good time, but Fox McCloud was not. Because of the few memories he still had of his father, Christmas was one of the ones he cherished the most and was one of the last good memories he had before his father went on that fabled mission, where he would never return. And the story is about him kind of coming to grips with that, and Crystal being there to help him, as well as Falco. And then they all have a happy Christmas, etc, etc. It was a fanfiction full of grammatical errors and just general errors and bad writing in general, but hey, somebody at one point said that it made them cry on DeviantArt, and uh, that's gotta count for something, right? At any rate, many of Pra's works would fall into this camp of fanfiction, and no matter which fandom you're in, you are guaranteed to come across this stuff eventually. It's even a favorite among certain fandoms, though it being about The Simpsons is certainly a bit of a strange choice to me, but hey, they are clearly very passionate about the series and the family's relationships, so yeah, Country Humans. Country Humans is a fandom of sorts that sprouted around anthropomorphized versions of countries. Think Hitalia, but uh, not anime guys. There is a ton, and I do mean a 
ton of art of this concept, as well as memes, of course. This also kind of reminds me of Country Balls, which is the same thing, but, uh, they're balls. The balls seem to be even more popular than the humans, actually, in my research, but they are both basically the same thing as far as the whole concept of behind characterizing a country as a character of sorts. Many a historical meme have been centered around these things, some more a risque than others, since often everyone's favorite part of history to discuss is World War II. Thus, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia are often depicted in these memes. And while many of the memes are just kind of used for normal affair and what have you, there are also some that have taken to using it as a means of denying the Holocaust amongst other historical atrocities. So it's all got a bit of an edge to it. But overall, this concept of anthropomorphizing countries has proven to be quite popular and garners quite the dedicated kind of fandom. The DA certainly had plenty of then and now. Russia ban. DA has rules in place that they barely moderate at all. They say porn is not allowed and uh, yeah clearly no one is enforcing that rule. Well this would eventually lead to Russia banning this site outright. Partly because they are very ban happy anyway because of their strict government, but also because there is a lot of pro-drug, pro-Nazi, pro-anti-government stuff, and of course, CP. Or stuff that at the very least, blah, but that would very much enjoy, even if it's not technically, legally, CP. And on that note, pornography is banned on DeviantArt. As I know before, and just a general fun fact, According to DeviantArt TOS, pornography of any kind can result in an account ban. But anyone who spent any amount of time on the site can tell you that this rule is not enforced very well. It's actually unknown why this rule goes so unenforced. Maybe it's just because it's more profitable to look the other way. Maybe it's gone on so long that they wouldn't even know how to go about stopping it at this point. Maybe the people on the website or the admins really like that content and this is just a legal formality of sorts. Or maybe all of these things or a combination of these things are true, as well as the people who run the site are just kind of lazy bums. But who knows. Gift card scam. A common scam hackers will do is send you a note claiming you want a free points gift card and would include a link that usually steals your information, if clicked on. DA, however, has never sold points via gift cards, but that hasn't stopped others from falling victim to the scam, unfortunately. Art stolen by major retailers. DA has gotten flack over major clothing stores, stealing designs from artists and selling them on shirts, with a big example being the creator behind the troll face having the troll face sold on t-shirts and DA refusing to take action. There are more examples of this, but yeah, not much more to note besides it's a thing that happens and it's pretty shitty. Merlogic 1 Merlogic 1, or more commonly called the Wonder Bread Guy, is a user who rose to infamy in 2016 to 2017 by commissioning thousands of dollars worth of art pieces involving busty white women buying Wonder Bread. As you can see here by these pieces, it's uh, <clears throat> very strange to say the least. Many of you are probably asking, why? Is this some sort of fetish centered around Wonder Bread? Is it all an elaborate joke? Who exactly is this guy and what does he pay for and want all this art of this extremely specific thing? Well, while some of you might have heard of this Wonder Bread obsession, I wonder how many of you have also heard that this guy also really enjoys stuff about deforestation, with one drawing showing two women with Wonder Bread sandwiches taking a selfie in front of a theme park called Sandwich Land with signs about deforestation. There's also several commissions he's had done with women with chainsaws having just cut down a whole forest of trees. It's usually a blonde woman as well. So what gives? Is this some sort of political statement? Is there something deeper to this strange obsession? Well, people have actually asked him as much, with one example being in 2018 when Tumblr user JoyfulAddict claimed to have spoken to Merlogic1 
and wrote, quote, He absolutely was not just a normal guy with a weird kink. This shit was his life pretty much. He had lots of talk about consumerism, slavery and capitalism and why they were all good things, almost to the point of religion to him. He tried talking to me about his commission of a comic of, I believe, Asami cutting down a rainforest and industrializing it, in like weird undertone of loving sandwiches. Everything he talked about in this aspect came down to sandwiches with him." Unquote. They then go on to say, quote, On a more dark and serious subject, he has been fired from his job and possibly disowned from his family for this kind of stuff. He talked about assaulting, sexually assaulting, and insulting the race or sexuality of his co-workers. People caught on that he was kind of fucked up and emailed his boss over this stuff and got him fired. I got to watch as he complained about it and the entire forum that he was on talking about it blew up for a good solid two hours over how fucked up this guy is for thinking he did nothing wrong and him insulting everyone. It was absolutely bonkers. Please do not give Merlogic commissions. His money isn't worth being associated with this man. Overall, he is a very disgusting person. And while it's fun to point and laugh, he really is not someone who should be given the time of day." Unquote. Now to be fair, I'm unsure if any of that information has been confirmed fully. But if true, then it certainly gives a little more insight into this strange obsession. Kinda. Later, he would also conduct an AMA on Reddit and his now defunct DA page, in which he spoke vaguely about his obsession and why this stuff seems to attract him, stating, quote, My first job I had was at a job called Bounty Farm, which was funded and supervised by an organization referred to as Petaluma People Services Center. I met my now ex-girlfriend at this place. When I was finally ready to go to her old apartment in Ronherd Park, and she let me touch her tits while we watched Howl's Moving Castle, they reminded me of Wonder Bread, since I was trying to pinpoint what the texture of breasts reminded me of the most, and Wonder Bread came to the closest." Unquote. So yeah, make of that what you will. Also, as one more random piece of trivia, Murr once commissioned the famed or rather infamous artist Shadman to draw porn for him, but he refused Murr's offer. Ari Banks slash Eclipse Saga. Before the reveal of DeviantArt Eclipse, user Ari Banks and friends decided to use an ARG to hint at the updated site layout before the official reveal. Now, for the few of you who don't know what an ARG is, an ARG, alternate reality game, is what it stands for, in a sense, is an interactive narrative story that plays out with viewers' input. It's a genre of storytelling that's quite popular over here on YouTube and in marketing campaigns. Anyway, Ari and Co. created the Eclipse Saga, a comic that had to be solved via viewers noticing clues slash details that could lead to codes and keys hinting at a greater plot at play. For example, a puzzle involved people viewing 10 statues in the story, teal, green, rose, copper, etc and viewing each statue through an alternate means to find the key and the secret within. The purple statue, Ghoul, or G-H-U-U-L, involved users needing to find a secret chat room, named after an island mentioned in the comic. From there, a bot would leak clues, but some were red herrings, so users had to pay attention to determine which were fake and which were real. Ari's journals contain cryptic hints as to the correct clues, chat room passwords, and the times the chat bot would give out clues. The ARG was met with overwhelming praise, and while Eclipse is seen as a very poor update, the comic and ARG are still remembered very fondly. The Lost DeviantArt Story Reddit user Tariko Pasta Sauce took to r slash lost media to find a supposed lost short story he had read on the website of DeviantArt some time ago. He claimed it was called The Family, with six parts to it. According to the Reddit post, he says, quote, The story focused on a man who works for a California magazine company, and his car breaks down in a small town where the sheriff takes him in. His house has a real old feel, and his 
little girl around 10 years old, had an older feel in the way she acted and talked. And the main character finds out that the sheriff has an age-altering device that's used to keep peace within the town and for monetary gain. Eventually, the MC takes the device and uses it on the sheriff to try and stop him. But that backfires when the sheriff's wife changes him back and turns her daughter and the MC into toddlers, basically just to demoralize them with a bath. And then their punishment is to be stuck as babies who can't do anything to retaliate. A user named AR Stories is believed to have been the author, but when contacted, the user has no memory of such a story. Certainly a strange sounding tale, but nothing outside the realm of normal DeviantArt affair, I suppose. Fetish flair and all. But it seems that there has been no updates to this lost media case, so it remains a mystery. Copy pasta comments. Spend long enough on DA and you're bound to run into a comment or string of comments with some spooky chain letter message attached to it. Something that was pretty common pretty much everywhere back in the day. From forums to emails, etc. Obviously, many of the people commenting these are generally little kids who don't know any better, but it's very humorous to see just comment chain after comment chain talking about sharing this or else some spooky girl is gonna get you at 3 a.m. or you'll get lucky in the next seven days or your whole family will perish in the next 48 hours or something. Lizzie Winkle Yin Yin Benzula, better known as Lizzie Winkle, was a 15 year old Roblox model maker loved by the fandom at large with many still holding her in high regard. However, unfortunately on November 29th of 2019, Lizzie Winkle lost her battle to cancer and her death was made public by her sister on Twitter. May she rest in peace. For no good reason. Talk about an infamous lolcow. For no good reason, real name Anthony Aguilar, is a reviled member of the brony community and host for the brony D&D. His biggest claim to fame is his ongoing feud with the YouTuber Lily Orchard, who is their own rabbit hole of bad opinions, controversy, and what have you, but maybe we'll get to them some other time. But regardless, Anthony and Lily Orchard arguing with one another to me is just basically two jackasses, both yelling and screaming at one another, both desperately trying to sound like the smartest person in the room. But regardless, Anthony is well known for attacking simply anyone who even slightly disagrees with him or criticizes him in any way imaginable. And if recent accusations are to be believed, has groomed numerous minors. There are a few videos talking about his various controversies. And at the time, he was also considered very argumentative and what many people would consider extremely toxic. Another controversy he found himself in was in 2018 when fellow brony toon critic Y2K was outed as a serial groomer and self-admitted pedophile, with thousands of disturbing DMs being leaked showing years upon years of sexting slash grooming various minors. For no good reason, or Anthony was very much aware that this had been going on for years before Critic was exposed publicly. With the Skype call being leaked confirming Anthony as well as many others who knew Critic was a danger to children, but they did nothing about it because they knew it would make them look bad. And frankly, they might have been trying to protect one of their own, for all we know. He along with the rest of their friend group once again fumbled the bag when Critic's grooming was made public by not getting the police involved, but instead telling Critic to just get off the internet before things start to get legal, when it should have gotten legal a long time ago. Showcasing that Anthony and his friend group are either spineless cowards or have dark secrets that they don't want getting out and are simply protecting one of their own. But I suppose I repeat myself a bit there either way. Beyond this, Anthony has found himself in an absurd amount of controversies, most stemming from him just accusing people of heinous shit daily for the sake of drama and easy clicks, some of the lowest form of content on the site, and a very dangerous game to play overall, 
These are some of my least favorite types of YouTubers. They just make up fucking claims about people with no evidence whatsoever, possibly ruining lives for internet clout, and maybe a bit of money. Which again is ironic since he actually did know someone who was a legitimate pedophile and did nothing about it, showcasing his hypocrisy and stupidity. His motivation for this remains unclear. Sometimes he says he just likes poking at people for a laugh. Sometimes he says he just wants to enforce quality control within the community. And sometimes he feels people have wronged him in a way that justifies him acting out this way. These days, the Brody fandom consider him an outcast, destined to be forgotten. Molly Hale is my friend. Oh my goodness, you guys are not ready for the absurd amount of information you're about to learn about this individual. They are by far one of the weirdest rabbit holes and lol cows on DeviantArt. And frankly, I found myself overwhelmed by it all when I first started researching this. To start, I think it's best that I read their profile's bio on their DeviantArt page. Quote, I am 0% I am 0% man-child. I am 0% idiot. I am 0% low cow. I am 0% liar. I am 0% I am 0% nostalgia tard. I am 0% spammer. I am 0% sicko. I am 0% kid littler. And I am 0% thief. I am clean, excellent, good, honest, innocent, truthful, nice, outgoing, smart, sweet, straight, and drug-free. And I am safe and careful on the internet. I am an only child living in my house, and all my personal info is secret. And I am proud of my artwork that I ever make, ever made, and will ever make. And credit goes to the sites I borrow pics from, and that's the truth." Unquote. Now, imagine how big of an undertaking I knew I had on my hands once I read this opening to his extensive ED article. Quote, Imagine someone who makes Alex Jones seem intelligent. Imagine someone who makes Chris Chan look like he has his shit together. Imagine someone who has a nostalgia boner so big that it makes Doug Walker blush. That someone is Eric Tasman Mokrakiek. I have no idea how to pronounce that, by the way, sorry. Unquote. Now to put it simply, Molly Hale, or Eric, posts bizarre and almost unreadable edits of children's show characters with either super specific, strange, or very disturbing captions. He's deluded himself into believing cartoon characters are real, and even that he owns a radio station by the name of Classics. If you go to the DA page, you'll see nearly 5,000 images of well, this variety, which I'll have playing in the background as we discuss this further. Because while that's a basic rundown of the guy, let's uh, dig a bit deeper, shall we? Big shout out to Kiwi Farms user PsychoNerd054 for condensing a lot, and I do mean a lot, of internet history into a digestible post. Quote, Eric Mokriak is a geeky 38-year-old man who has some rather weird tastes. Like, really, really weird tastes. Particularly, he has weird obsessions with children from obscure cartoons from the 80s and 90s and game shows. Eric likes to make a bunch of YouTube videos and DeviantArt pictures that are made primarily of stock images, most of which are about little kids from very obscure cartoons, doing all kinds of weird shenanigans. He does this so much to the point where it's fucking creepy. Besides the videos and pictures, he makes a lot of scat fetish fanfiction, which includes said characters, art, and videos. Now normally I don't do this, but I legitimately have nothing to say for this part of the thread, other than I am actually pretty amazed how much his art reveals about himself. I'm not kidding. The shit this guy makes is so crazy that any kind of commentary I could make simply wouldn't enhance how batshit insane it is. In this part, the thread literally writes itself. By the way, it appears this guy closed his YouTube account, but luckily, YouTuber user Junior Fang Returns mirrored almost all the videos he's made." Unquote. In case you're wondering, I did happen to take a peek over Junior Fang Returns 
um, uploads, which now he seems to be going under the name of Jake Cook. But nonetheless, from what I gathered, it's a lot of rants that are kind of tossed together. Uh, Eric seemed to be a fan of doing this. And he also did a review of the Superman 64 video game and had an intro that was very much inspired or rather ripped off from Armake 21 who was an OG video game reviewer from back in the day that I'll eventually do an Internet Fables on. But I digress. Here's a small clip from that Superman 64 review so you can get a taste for Eric's voice and I guess uh, his style of video. In 1999, people, Titus, a company that has a very shitty reputation for making games on pretty much various consoles, decides to make a Superman game for the N64. Doesn't that sound awesome? No, it doesn't! Why do I say that? Because it's one of the worst fucking games games I've ever played, and it's a good thing that I did not play this game in my fucking childhood. That's right, people. I'm talking about the abysmal Superman 64. If I ever buy a cartridge from you, I am seriously going to annihilate the fucking cartridge, whether it be via knives, via burning the fucking cartridge, or getting a goddamn shotgun and using it as a fucking target. I don't care what I use. That game... The fucking producers of the game should be fucking ashamed of themselves for making this pile of shit. The goddamn procrastinators. They spent maybe a week on it by the looks of this. If I ever find the head person of Titus, or what was... Titus, I am going to go at their fucking house in the middle of the night and kill them in their fucking sleep. The person of Titus needs to be taught a fucking lesson, and that is not license shitty fucking games. I know, people, it's a Superman game. And what do you expect from a Superman game? You expect shitty quality, but not this bad. You know what I'm going to give this game, people? A fucking zero out of ten! Now, as for the art, several specific examples are shown here, which again, I think you can pretty well see are very random, nonsensical, and kind of accidentally funny at times. As mentioned, he also makes fan fictions of various kinds, but the most prevalent of these fan fictions are scat fetish ones. That's uh, shit fetish ones in case you forgot. Here is an excerpt from one of them. Quote, bad case of the chocolate pears. Molly was having a very bad case of the chocolate pears. She tried her hardest to stop doing chocolate pears in her pants. I can't stop doing poo-poo in my pants, said Molly. Molly marched around her room. Suddenly, a chocolate pear dropped into her pants. Molly marched to her little bench and sat down. She squashed her chocolate pear. Molly threw her squashed chocolate pear in the toilet, wiped herself, and changed her underwear and got redressed. The drum from the tailspin bumper came from her butt. Excuse me said Molly. At least I don't get spanked for that, said Molly, unquote. Oh, and uh, here's another excerpt from a Sonic Sat AM fanfiction of his. Quote, Tails was sent to bed early by Sally, with Ted Horn spankings to his rear end. Young man, I hope those hard spankings have taught you a lesson in using that kind of language, shouted Sally angrily. Yes, Sally, I understand, said Tails sadly. I hope you're sorry, said Sally. I am, said Tails sadly. Okay, 
You're grounded tomorrow. All day in your room, said Sally. Okay, said Tails. Sally put all her of Tails' toys in the closet. No more swearing, okay, said Sally. Okay, said Tails. Dulcie was there. She had a bad case of the chocolate wagons. Dulcie wore clothes. I can't stop doing poo-poo in my pants, said Dulcie. <laughs> Dulcie tried eating dragonberries, but it did not work. Dulcie still had a bad case of the chocolate wagons. What a fucking weird way to say shit. The chocolate wagons. Very creative, must say. Tails just had his meals and fell asleep after his dinner. He did not have dessert. Sally came home to check on Tails. I hope you know now that swear words are not okay to use, said Sally. I learned my lesson, said Tails. What's wrong with Dulcie, asked Tails. She has a bad case of the chocolate wagons, said Sally. What's a chocolate wagon, asked Tails. That's how dragons go number two, dear, said Sally. They look just like a toy wagon, then they pull like a radio flyer, said Tails. Right, only soft, warm, solid, and brown, <laughs> said Sally, unquote. So, uh... <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yeah, no comment required, I think. Now, I'd like to share one more video clip from Eric's channel that seems to have been saved. Eric's infamous Mash Game Hollywood Squares with Lyrics, where we get to hear him sing and make up lyrics to the intro song from the old game show, Match Game Hollywood Squares. Yes, this is true. It's true. Yes, I is. I'm not full of chunky dust. The time will not fight the crust. Chase in front of the camera when he stands at his stool. He stands by his desk in school each day. He's, he plays with the blocks and other toys. He plays with the white guys and goes out to his big sister Kim eats a lot of candy bars just like that in a flash. Yeah. Man, what was with locales back in the day and like making up songs to go with uh, game shows? Actually, what is with game shows and these sorts of people in general? That, that, that seems to be a weird connection. Uh, comment down below if you got a theory. I, I don't have any at the moment. The Kiwi Farms post goes on to say, quote, classics. Finally, Eric here believes that he owns some fictional broadcasting service known simply as classics. At least from what I've found out, this proposed network that he's been dreaming up all of his life is supposed to show nothing but game shows. Not much is known about this particular broadcast, mainly because Eric never really explains the concept of it coherently. Thankfully, a much older post made by at SuperCauly on the Closing Logos group thread did allow for some pointers. Unfortunately though, half of the stuff she discussed has been deleted or taken down. So the best I could do is essentially base this off of what was described and said post. Said program would have broadcasted such gems as Ash Ketchum Feud, Digimon, Ty's Date, The Emmy Show, and You Can't Do That at Walmart, unquote. Now, from what I've gathered, Eric has been doing this stuff since around 2004. He apparently started his online shenanigans on the Closing Logo Group, a close-knit group who are passionate about logos and logo types, where he would spam the site with his MS Paint masterpieces, with animated children plastered on top of them. Speaking of that, he seems to really love these two characters from the cartoon Dragon Tales, and of course, this little girl that he has for his avatar fucking everywhere. Whatever the fuck she's from. It, it's apparently from a cartoon or something called Sullivan Families, which I have never heard of before. And often, they are used to come to his defense, such as these 
uh, testimony pictures. You will be free and have your freedom forever, Eric. I will defend you and your freedom. Don't listen to them, Eric. You are not a pedophile at all. I am your friend, even though I am only six years old. You're not a pedophile at all, Eric. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Needless to say, it's easy to see why many people theorize that Eric might actually think the cartoon characters are real. Which brings me to a personal story Eric himself shared years ago about his friendship with a real-life six-year-old he met when he, at that time, was 17, which I think I will now read in full. Quote, On May 1998, there was one girl that I loved very much. She was six, and her name was Kimberly. She was sitting next to me at Wayne's birthday party in 1998. She became my friend on the afternoon of May 29th at 4.45 p.m. I decided to write a song about her in 1999, and it is track 10 off Friends Walking Piano Cake. And in the summer of 1998, Kimberly turned seven. I still loved her. In July, I went to the planetarium and I saw her pretty blue eyes after I dropped off my lunch. The carnival was on August 12th. I was getting ready for the carnival. I gave her a hug on the day of August 12th, 1998. And on December 18th of 1998, she was in the audience. I said hello to her, and she was still my friend, my buddy, my pal, my companion, my acquaintance, my amigo. On March 10th, 1999, she was sitting next to me at bowling. She got a lot of love in me, Kimberly. She was happy to see me, and she's still my friend, my buddy, my pal, my companion, my acquaintance, my amigo. On May 24th, 1999, she was at the bowling party. She was excited to see me, and I was excited to see her. And she was so happy, and we played, and I won. And we had pizza, and the ice cream cake. On the Friday of the first week of summer school in 1999, Kimberly and I were at Allier State Park. It was so much fun, and she was happy. On Monday, Kimberly said hello. We went to Atlantic City, but she wasn't there. I was disappointed that she didn't show up. Then, on the waterworks trip, I played in the pool, so did Kimberly. She was eight by then. On December 17th of 1999, Kimberly was happy to see me, and I was very proud of Kimberly. And on June 14th of 2000, I introduced my mom to her, and on the waterworks trip, I came back, Kimberly was there. And on March 7th of 2001, Kimberly was at the bowling party, and she was cheering her brothers on. And on June 13th, Kimberly was watching the show. And on August 9th, 2001, Kimberly was at the water park, and I had lunch with her, and I had a lot of fun. And at the carnival, I talked to Kimberly. And that's the story of Kimberly, unquote. Very, very uncomfortable, especially the fact that he remembers all the dates, and <sighs> the way he describes everything, just, it's very, it gives me an uneasy feeling. The whole thing comes off as stalkerish almost to say the least oh and by the way in case you hadn't uh, taken notice from the text on screen everything this man writes has every single word capitalized except sometimes in his fan fictions for some reason which in the long scheme of things isn't that weird compared to the actual contents of said text but it still makes reading anything by this man a terrible chore as well as his general grammar and the way that he writes it's just not all there there's several other strange things he seems fixated on like these pictures where characters want to sit on the floor in the backs of cars i love sitting on the floor in the back of the cars and talking i enjoy sitting on the floor in the back of cars and talking and eating french fries sitting on the floor in the back of cars and talking is what i do best i love sitting on the floor in the back of cars me too. It's fun to sit on the floor in the back of cars. Sitting on the floor in the back of cars is fun to do. I love doing, and I have since I was four. Hey, butthead, let's, let's sit on the floor in the back of cars. Uh, okay. <laughs> Which there has been no explanation for as to why he's so fixated on this one thing. He's made around a hundred different pictures depicting basically this exact same thing. There are also several of this exact same type of image where it says, I am a Toys R Us kid. Do you remember me? 
Do you remember who I am? Do you remember my name? I'm not sure if this is in reference to something, but all I can say is, is that there is a ton of these that have been made and they are all extremely ominous. But then again, quite a few things this guy makes are in general quite ominous when taken in uh, the full depth of everything that he's saying, creating, and doing. I could go on for a while longer, but I think you've more than gotten the point of this strange, fecal matter enjoyer, backseat sitter, cartoon kid loving, extremely disturbed individual who clearly has some mental issues and a very eccentric fetish filled imagination. Let us hope that he sticks to cartoon characters and stays far, far away from actual children in the future. Maternity Through Time Many communities will hold events and by far one of the most successful was Maternity Through Time, an event held by Impregnation to draw uh, pregnancy-themed art of various time periods, be it Ancient Rome, Viking Times, the Future, etc. And not much more to this one than that though, I suppose. Tales Gets Trolled slash Laserbot this one definitely should have been on this iceberg a lot sooner, like tier 1 or 2 type of stuff. But better late than never, right? Tales Gets Trolled refers to an original comic shared on DA by user Laserbot called, well, Tales Gets Trolled, in which, as the name suggests, showcases Tales getting trolled. The comic is pretty similar to the Zootopia abortion comic, funnily enough, and that one panel went mega viral as a meme causing an uptick in popularity, although quite a few of its pages from the comic had a very similar meme hood granted. We're all well aware of the now iconic image of Tails with an absolutely shocked expression, as well as the other extremely expressive pictures that while not maybe drawn in the best technical light, the emotion really comes through. Now there has been a fair bit of debate over the years that if the comic was made ironically, or not, with many arguing that Laserbot truly wanted to make a genuine comic, but saw how parts of it became memes and just sort of rolled with the joke, while others argue that it was always the point to be intentionally bad. I personally evolved the mind that it was a genuine comic effort. You can kind of tell by the way it's written, the way it's drawn, it just feels like a genuine effort that evolved through time. There's a certain charm to genuine passion projects such as these that I think is extremely difficult to mask. But no matter which way you slice it, Tales Gets Trolled is an absolutely hilarious comic, both for its art, but also often for its very edgy and at times crazy dialogue. If you know, you know. But if you don't, I highly recommend that you give it a try. There's also several good videos on YouTube that chronicle some of the events of the story and the various dramas and whatnot associated with the comic and its creator, including a great one by Cybershell. It's quite a trip that, believe it or not, have some panels later on that go pretty fucking hard. Jsonic 1977 as far as locales go, Jsonic is probably the most bizarre we'll encounter this tier. But sadly, he will not be the most disgusting this tier. And trust me, when I say that, you're gonna learn to really fear this fact. As the name would imply, Jsonic, real name Jason Creever, is a Sonic fan, and one who's risen to a fair amount of infamy recently. Of course, when hearing Sonic and Locals together, one expects them to be like Chris Chan, which is a fair assessment, but Jason is on a whole different breed of deranged. He himself claims he was in a coma at the age of 18, and in this coma, Sonic the Hedgehog visited him in a dream, resulting in Sonic becoming a savior of sorts to him upon coming out of the coma. This has made Jason absolutely obsessed with Sonic in every way imaginable. And before you go thinking, oh, so he plays the games, watches the shows, reads the comics, buys the merch, and acts like a general crazy person about Sonic. What's new for a Sonic fan, right? But remember that I said in every way, including sexually. As of 2020, he is a self-admitted plushophile. Plushophilia being the sexual attraction slash desire 
for sexual intercourse with a plush toy. And the object, or plush in this case, of his desire is a plush Sonic the Hedgehog. This alone is enough to raise some eyebrows, but the Sonic plush in question, Jason has been having sex with for well over 20 years. Let me just repeat that. He has been having sex with a Sonic plush for over 20 years. The exact same plush, which he proudly talks about never cleaning either, mind you. So one could only imagine the state that is in. Except you don't have to imagine because I'm about to show you a picture of it. Viewer discretion is advised. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Soak it all in. Cod knows that that plush certainly has. There are more pictures of this plush in various other compromising positions, but I'll save you the trouble. This on its own is disgusting enough. Putrid, beyond imaginably ghastly. But around 2019 or so, screenshots surface on Kiwi Farms showcasing JSONic sexting with minors on Telegram and even sending them CP. He would be exposed again on Twitter in late 2019 when a decoy by the name of Kanix had acquired proof that JSONic was attempting to groom them with the decoy stating numerous times that they were under 18. Truly a vile, disgusting man overall. Andrew Dobson, more known by his online pseudonyms Tom Preston or Catty N, Dobson has cemented himself as not only a hated member of DeviantArt, but the web as a whole. He's also a pretty funny locale with many infamous incidents under his belt. Under his Catty N persona, he share his own inflation art, you know, as you do on DeviantArt, but he wouldn't do much in the way of getting himself any relevance until sharing his debut autobiographical comic entitled So You're a Cartoonist, which ended up garnering him a modest following. Many of these comics featured what people might call hashtag relatable artist problems, I guess. But more often than not, it wasn't necessarily hashtag relatable things and more so extremely personal, spiteful, venomous sort of thoughts that was constantly flowing through Dobson's mind. Like his character often getting pissed at how nobody approaches him to buy his books, showcasing a bit of entitlement in his attitude, as well as a lot of comics featuring straw men for him to smugly dismantle. Issues would arise as his comics would eventually be discovered by 4chan, and thus a torrent of criticism would be launched his way. Many took issue with the very virtue signaling angle he took with his comics, and heavy use of straw men as I noted before. Of his critics, to paint himself as a victim, or the smug know-it-all, that he has the answers to every argument for. This devolved into him leaving very long, very drawn out comments to anyone saying anything negative about him, which were riddled with ad hominem attacks and sarcasm. Soon he'd outright house, delete, and even block all negative comments entirely, which as one would expect, only showcased to 4chan, they found a new target slash locale. It also showcased he wasn't able to take any angle or measure of criticism and, well, given everything else, made him a very easy target to hate and mock. Though his caricature and persona seemed like the smug know-it-all that had the answers to everything, in truth, he was a very sensitive man who is bitter and angry at everyone around him, believes he is entitled to more than what he has, and sees anyone who criticizes him is someone to be silenced. Dobson's inability to accept criticism has resulted in a multitude of explosive reactions with entire blogs and YouTube channels dedicated to cataloging that, along with the many instances of his blatant hypocrisy. I go into more, and honestly his story might be worth discussing more in detail another time, in another, like, his own video perhaps, but his history and infamy has been something of an internet legend, with a Kiwi Farms thread 1,252 pages long 
at the time of the writing of this script, so his history is clearly too long to fully cover here today. But I think you've got a little bit of a taste, even if there are some far more specific and at times far more funny instances that are connected to him. Nick Bait. And for our final entry this tier, we are finally at the most disgusting this tier has to offer. Oftentimes, when discussing lol cows, the term horror cow comes up eventually. That is to say, someone who is no longer funny, or maybe never truly was funny, and instead of being an endless pit of people laughing, it is instead an endless pit of a human being of horrors. There is no silliness to be had, only abject terror at the actions that they commit. Horror cows, due to their very nature, are often reported to the police, and the documentation on them sort of changes from look at all these silly things they did to instead gathering evidence for all the terrible things that they are doing and have done. The term horror cow, however, doesn't even come close to describing Nick Bate as he's quite possibly one of the most demented, revolting, and degenerate users to ever grace DeviantArt. Nick has been active on quite a few platforms, on both DeviantArt and YouTube to Twitter, and in all, he has made a name for himself. However, when it comes to actually talking about the scope of Nick's story, there is actually just way too much to cover here. So we'll just focus on the most notable events and his brief stints on DeviantArt. He first joined DA under the name Hagarumon. Nick would create a comic called Coffee Crew, along with a very strange and bizarre sexual writing, with many unfortunately highlighting another thing Nick is infamous for. Nick has absolutely no sense of hygiene, as he's admitted to going weeks or even months without showering, and his teeth are practically falling out. He's also a self-admitted Caporifoliac, and seems to really have a thing for assholes as well, and he has an extreme sexual desire to consume feces. There is an absurd amount of documentation around Nick's fetish, as he's pretty much made it a key part of his identity, along with the thousands of DMs from him showcasing this disturbing devotion to his fetish. He also stalked a woman for years upon years, which again, is a little too complicated to get into, but amongst all the other things, he also is an internet stalker. However, if you can believe it or not, all these things, while disgusting, weird, and evil, do not come even close to the most infamous thing Nick has ever done. In April of 2015, Nick was arrested for the rape of his seven-year-old sister. Nick had been sexually abusing his young sister for years, and even bragged about it in numerous leaked chat logs where he gleefully talked about how he forcefully engaged in oral intercourse with her among other absolutely stomach-churning acts of pure, abject evil. However, he immediately denied everything when all this became public, taking to Twitter to claim innocence despite overwhelming evidence and an active group of people online dedicated to helping and making sure this man went behind bars. And thankfully, he would do just that, as he was sentenced to 40 years in jail, with him even attempting to appeal his case but being denied every time, thankfully. That's the broad strokes of Nick's story. But if you'd like more info of all the gritty details about this festering boil of a human being and those who were able to take him down, then I highly recommend Cecil McFly's video covering his whole story. It's a great watch that even despite the truly dark contents, at least ends on a semi-happy note in that he will never be able to harm a child again. Yo, thank you all for watching part 4 of the Deviant Art Iceberg. We are really ramping up towards the finale of this iceberg now. We got two more parts after this one. 
So uh, I hope you're looking forward to seeing just how deep the DeviantArt rabbit hole really goes. And also, I don't usually ask this, but if any of you have any icebergs that you think might fit the channel or that you might like to see me cover in the future after this iceberg is over, please feel free to suggest them down below or even better, DM me on Twitter or Discord or maybe even Instagram and give me some information about said iceberg and or if you happen to have created the iceberg as well. I have a few ideas for which one I might do next, but I'm definitely open to suggestions and I really love being able to cover icebergs that are within our own community. So my DMs are open for that. There's some pretty big videos and projects coming up over this next month or two. And if you would like more information about said content and what to expect, then be sure to support me via Patreon or through channel memberships. As I am also almost completely done with the Sonnet.exe remake reading, which the finale of will be coming out this month. So if you want to see that exclusive reading and exclusive content, again, another reason to support me via Patreon or channel memberships. And speaking of, I want to also take this opportunity to thank all of my loyal patrons and channel members who are already here, including all of my Night Eggs and Night Owlets, as well as a super special thank you to all of my great Night Owls, including Sharif, Channel 11, Hexmaniac Hannah, Tony Teramaya, Icy Dice, Ho Hot, Medusa's Hex, and Tyler the Leper, as well as a super duper special thank you to all of my Arch Owls, including the Fearless Forgotten Ace, the Super Saiyan Sword, the Super Saiyan Star Punch Gaming, the wise Sagely Nicodemus, the extremely talented Cherry NGT, and the always Chi Vibes Zen Garden Party. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel and supporting me. But with that said, until next time, this has been Dylan the Night Owl, flying off.